Okay, so yes, so I'm going to be talking about um, uh, the role of data in teaching introductory economics modules. And this kind of, this is being developed for a book chapter, but it sort of, it came out of um, a presentation that I did in a uh, symposium last year. So what's, what's, what's this research about? So what I really want to do is I want to think about, you know, in terms of surveying, think about the range of different approaches that academics take when incorporating data in the teaching of micro or, or just general introductory economic theory. To so think about how we can take all these kind of this grand variety of approaches that, that no doubt exist and think about how can we classify these approaches and having classified these Think about, well, we have these classifications. How can we get the best out of the various approaches that are being delivered by, by lecturers? Because obviously everybody has subtle differences in their own approaches. But I really want to identify kind of the similarities between sort of groups of groups of uh, The one thing I'm not going to do here, which I don't know, may be inspiring for some people, or may make people happy, is I'm not actually going to say this is how you should be incorporating data in your teaching. You know, people have been teaching for a lot longer than I have. Um, we're in a pandemic. Everyone's tired. And the point is that actually, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to say, you know, this this particular method is much better than the others. We should all be doing this. I'm just really start thinking about, you know, how can we get the best out of what it is that we're doing? So, you know, telling people you're doing a good job, maybe tweak something, I don't know. So the approach I'm generally taking, well, at the moment, we're kind of in this kind of a starting point where we've got kind of a, a, a what I call a micro survey going on. So it's a very, very short uh, survey. And sort of developing this conceptual framework from kind of learning theories. Now, what I've discovered over the past sort of few weeks, past couple of months, is that these are kind of naturally kind of talking to each other. So the as people are answering the survey, it's kind of pushing me down particular routes in terms of learning theory, but then that learning theory is having to force me to adjust the survey a little bit. So the survey is subtly evolving, but not in major ways. And then from these, the sort of the next stage of the research is really thinking about, you know, given what we've learned from the survey, given the learning theory that we have there, um, sort of digging into some of the approaches that people are using through some kind of semi-structured interviews, but also in our survey, in this like micro survey that I'm sure many of you or some of you might have filled out, um, really digging into these qualitative survey fields as well. But at present, we really are up at this part, and it's sort of this part, some quantitative, quantitative summary and some kind of learning theory that I'm really going to focus on in this presentation. So I guess the starting, a useful starting point is to think, well, well why, why do we use data? And this sounds like such a trivial question because everybody or most people do it. but it's always worth really taking a reflective pause to think about, well, well, why is it that we were actually using data? We use data so much in our, um, in our teaching for certainly introductory economics. Well, it, gives, it provides examples, right? And we know that what examples, we know how useful examples are. They get students' attention, they make them less passive. It anchors ideas. Um, but I mean, there are many other sorts of examples that can do this. You can, you know, numerous people have written about using Simpsons episodes to grab attention and to anchor ideas. And similarly, you know, it's it's building bridges between your existing knowledge and the content and learning that you actually that you as a lecturer might want to, well, or rather, sorry, between students' existing knowledge and content that you as a lecturer might want to uh, develop. Okay. Um, crucially, though, data starts uh, kind of deviating from other sorts of examples. Certainly for intrinsically interested students, um, it's very relevant. They may get a kick out of using data because ultimately they have an interest in economics. And particularly, we perceive data analysis to be some kind of key proficiency within economics in a way that other forms of analysis, qualitative analysis or, or, or uh, primary source analysis 
are not seen as key proficiencies. So this is reasons why, um, why we use data more than anything else. You know, we could just, we could wheel some members of the public out and ask them questions if we wanted to, which would be, if you like, a qualitative analysis, but we don't, we use data. So thinking, given that we use data and think having, having sort of taken that moment to reflect, um, we can think about building a conceptual framework. So I want to think about it in terms of the timing of, of when in a class you might use data whether data is used to stimulate interest before introducing some economic theory or concept, or whether data is actually used to reinforce a concept of theory which we've actually taught in our classes. Similarly, there are different ways that we can actually teach or use the data in the classroom. Given that we've, we're introducing data either before or after, we can either sort of use data in a sort of a transmissive way. So actually showing students graphs, showing students summaries, tables, statistics, um, in a kind of as a in transmissive, transmitting this information. Alternatively, you know, we can actually use data in a very experiential way. And um, so giving students the time and space to work with the, uh, to work with the, um, the data that they have. So we have these two kind of extremes of a, of a spectrum. And so I thought we can probably combine these to think about, if you like, a, 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 a physical um, um, visual kind of analogy for the different approaches that we have. So where we have on, on, on sort of on our vertical, the idea of stimulation versus reinforcement. And on our horizontal, we have transmiss. So if you like lecture, lecture led, and transactional, which is transaction being the kind of the interplay between students, the back and forth, the construction of knowledge. So where, if you like, just thinking about these, these quadrants, this quadrant would clearly be linked to, if you like, looking at data after theory, but having students doing that. And, and up here, we've got introducing, da introducing data to motivate a theory led by the lecturer and, uh, and so on. So we've got some results from our survey. The survey is still ongoing, but we've got some interesting results. So just looking at a kind of a, a heat map of, this, uh, of, of, of our responses. So the majority, well, not the majority, around 47% of the responses generally use data solely in a reinforcement uh, capacity. To, to reinforce a theory which, is in, which they've introduced. 26% of the responses use data to stimulate uh, um, students to get their attention before introducing the theory. And in terms of the teaching approach, look at the heat map for that, most of the teaching involving data was actually student-led. Um, around 17% of the responses, um, both, uh, either had it purely led by the lecturer or alternatively a bit of both. So let's put these together now and actually have a look, think about um, applying these to the, to, to the full grid. And we get something like this. So 50% of the respondents only use data to reinforce and had that done by students. But if we track the heat map up, we've got some really interesting results here. 15% of the responses um, use data both for stimulation and reinforcement, but also had it up delivered by both lecturer and students. And this was generally a case here of lecturers introducing a theory using data and then allowing students to go and play with data. So amazingly, we don't have many um, observations down here. And this is something that I, uh, I need to investigate in the survey itself. And up here, we've got this 15% on our heat map of lecturers, if you like, just only using data for the purposes of introducing theory. So these are just as a previews of our results. Um, what can we do with this? Well, we can think about, given that we've seen that there are some transmission approaches, there are some um, transactional approaches, we can think about how we get the best out of these approaches. So, 
Transmissions, great. Learning can be tightly regulated. It allows a focus on core competencies, nice alignment between teaching and assessment. But ensure that actually, because we are, if you like, telling students and hoping the students just pick up the information that we are transmitting to them, that there's potential implications for assessment of these uh, of, of student learning. And the other thing with transactional and constructivist approaches is that um, often we need to do a lot of scaffolding in terms of, um, because we're, we're allowing students the freedom to explore the data, thinking about how we can focus students on the, uh, the task at hand. So that just about wraps us up, but just think about the next steps. My survey is still open and I would love people to continue filling it out. Um, all this stuff is based around on a usable sample of about 50 responses, but of course, more is always better. Um, to carry out the qualitative analysis I mentioned at the start, um, and then to start thinking about um, some consistencies between using this qualitative analysis to uh, think about good practice and consistency between objectives and teaching approach. And obviously the big one about the implications for blended and remote learning. So thank you. Um, you've been a great audience. Thank you very much.